Welcome to Money Talks 2012. I'm Genevieve Westcott with your latest financial news from across New Zealand and around the globe. So pay attention and saddle up. In this edition, the Chinese are double happy. They're not only celebrating the Year of the Dragon, they're ecstatic about snapping up 16 lucrative dairy farms in little old New Zealand. Is it open season on our precious farmland? The government gets tough with Fonterra with plans for new milk regulations. Fonterra is spitting tax. Will it fix the price problems for Kiwi consumers? And the Prime Minister backpedals on how quickly he'll get the government books back into surplus, but he stands by rebuilding Christchurch as the top priority for the country. All this and much, much more coming up. But first, let's talk the latest in market and commodity information with rural economist James Shortle. James, Happy New Year. Same to you, Genevieve. Great to have you back. What's going on in the markets around the world? Well, it's been quite surprising because over the past uh, month, since we've seen the, the beginning of 2012, their markets have actually been quite positive. And although the last couple of days we've seen U.S. markets slip just a little bit, um, in general, uh, U.S. markets have, have been pretty good. Yeah, and, and despite stronger uh, incomes, uh, I see that consumers still aren't spending the way they should. That's got to be a worry. Yeah, so in general, uh, we have seen a, an upwards trend for, for, for share markets, um, particularly out of the U.S., because a lot of people have been feeling quite positive about where the, uh, the U.S. economy has been going. But just over the past few days, we've seen a couple of more disappointing news coming out, um, and that's put a bit of a dampener on things. We've seen equity markets slip a little bit. Um, some of those things are you know, retail sales out of the U.S., have been quite as strong, so people are still saving a lot more, saving for the rainy day. They're a bit worried about what's happening around the world at the moment. And meanwhile, uh, Europe is still a major concern. Uh, I see there's just been a meeting of the European zone leaders. 27 leaders were there. They've all agreed to go for closer fiscal unity, whatever that is. But Britain's out, and, and I believe Hungary's out as well. Yeah, they just, they just can't seem to get a uh, you know, consolidated view on what's happening and, and just don't seem to be dealing with um, some of the critical issues. So that's going to continue to be in the background, I think, and going to continue to be there for, for quite some time yet. And, uh, you know, we have seen equity markets lift, as I've mentioned, but um, I think they probably might have just lifted a little bit too much um, and we've got a bit out of hand uh, just the, uh, this early part of the year and these European issues are going to continue to to cause some problems. There's some countries out of Europe that potentially just slip back into recessionary mode towards the end of last year. Yeah, unemployment in Europe, of uh, course, huge problem. 16.5 million people unemployed. 10.4% on average, but in Spain up to 23%. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's really, really scary some when you start looking at some of these figures and the deficits that are climbing, um, the, the Greeks just don't seem to be able to get things under control um, and they're still a little bit unsure as to how much money they're actually going to need. And actually, uh, I, I picked up an a, a interview with George Soros. Um, he's a, you know, a global hedge yes. fund manager, very successful, and, yeah. he's, and he was uh, talking just over the past few days. He's thinking that could potentially be a lost decade for the Europeans. You know, a lot, this, a lot like a was in South America in the 90s, um, some of the issues in Japan and that sort of thing. And he's going to be, he's going to continue to be a, a problem for Europe for, for quite some time to come. Yeah, yeah I'm with George there. Uh, I think where he goes, the rest of us should listen. Uh, <laughs> but meantime, the New Zealand dollar is running very hot. Not great for the farmers. Yeah, well, the Kiwi dollar lifting again, um, and it really has been because of what's been happening in, uh, with equity markets around the world. A little bit more, um, a little bit more appetite for risks from investors, I guess, with the Kiwi dollar lifting. And we've lifted a gain over the past 24 hours up to around 82 and a half and that's about sort of five six cents since uh, since uh, just before or since the beginning of the year and probably seven or eight cents since just before Christmas so these are some pretty hefty heights and uh, they'll be causing some uh, some heartache for farmers here at home for sure yeah and uh, in terms of pricing internationally some of them now are beginning to take a hit James yeah well I think uh, if we look at uh, some of the specific sectors beef in particular has uh, has dropped off a little bit and there's uh, no question that the New Zealand dollar against the US is causing that, that problem because when we look at some of the, uh, the markets out of the US, beef futures are at all-time highs. They set seven consecutive all-time highs through, through January, um, the highest that they've ever been uh, since 1964 when they were first implemented. So, and so the question is, how long is that going to hold? Well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm generally pretty positive about the US market for beef, but uh, the question is around the Kiwi dollar. That is taking the shine off of what the returns that farmers could be getting, even though um, you know, they're still getting paid pretty well in terms of schedules back here at home. Dairy prices doing well, uh, selling lots of products to the rest of the world. Yeah, dairy prices have been holding holding up pretty, pretty well in general over the past couple of months. Um, of course, in, in January, then prices lifted about 1.5% at the latest global dairy trade auction. 
And, uh, you know, con considering how much volatility we've seen over the past sort of two to three years for dairy prices, um, we've actually seen some, some relative stability since about September or, or October of this year. So prices have been stumbling between sort of one to two to three percent uh, increases in falls, which is, which is quite good news for farmers. Great. Thanks, James. Coming up after the break, how many millions of dollars will Landcorp be forced to pay out in rent each year for the honour of running the new Chinese-owned dairy farms in God's Own? The state sell-off is just getting started, with Mighty River Power next up to get it where the chicken got the axe. And ASB Chief Economist Nick Tuffley is in the house with his latest quarterly forecast. So don't go away. Ponder this in our Farmers Facts and Figures quiz. In the past two years, how many hectares of agricultural land in New Zealand have been bought by foreigners? The answer when we return. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Money Talks. Just before the break, we asked you, in the past two years, how many hectares of New Zealand's agricultural land have been bought by foreigners? 357,056 hectares have been sold to overseas interests. And everybody's still talking about Friday's decision to let the Chinese buy up those 16 Crafer farms, another 7,800 hectares of prime farmland now controlled by China. Joining us now is ASB Chief Economist Nick Tuffley. Very quickly, your reaction. Well, we do have processes that we follow here in New Zealand, and that's the Overseas Investment Office, and they've gone through that and produced a 75-page report as to why they've let it through. I think some observations I would make is, is that um, within that, the uh, purchaser has uh, said that they are looking into spending $100 million marketing New Zealand dairy products in China over the next five years. So uh, there are perhaps some benefits in there that we haven't realised, but there's a process um, that's been followed. James, your reaction very quickly. I've still got some question marks. I've had a look through the uh, through the OAO decision and so the basis of it, and um, you know it seems it seems quite good on the surface, but um, uh, we have to they have to put the money where their mouth is, I guess. I mean they're talking about spending as Nick's pointed out, it's talking about spending the money. That'd be great if that happens. Um, you know they uh, th there's a whole lot of other things that are that are potentially going on. Uh, question marks around Landcorp's involvement in there too. Um, you know, I think it, in, in some ways it is, it is good news that we've got, um, we've got some management capability and management experience staying here in New Zealand, but the real question is I wouldn't have liked to have seen the fact that Lamb Court is involved in it um, being a basis for them uh, approving the deal. Um, so that is a bit of concern for me, for me. Yeah, some could say we are going to be tenants in our own land. We're going to be paying out to, uh, I think it's up to $18 million a year uh, from what uh, some of the critics are saying. Yeah, and I mean, they've also talked about increasing production and things like that on, uh, you know, um, and uh, increasing exports of New Zealand product and there's probably no question that those farms have, have been run down but the one thing that the Crafers did a very good job of when they were farming is that they are excellent farmers and, and so uh, you know, those farms have probably suffered a little bit since, um, since, they have, uh, since they've been taken off those farms um, in terms of production um, so it's not going to be difficult to, uh, to lift them out of, out of what they have been over just over the past uh, probably two years now. Hold that thought. We'll come back to the Crafers, but I want to know what's the latest with the, the quarterly forecast. Uh, what's ASB got to, to tell the farmers at home? Well, we see the economy here grinding along, so it's that gradual recovery continuing. And I have to say that these days we have to talk about two alternative paths, and there's the one that uh, we will hope which will go down, which is where Europe manages to uh, stop uh, you know, another financial crisis from, from blowing up, in which case, yes, Europe's likely to be in recession for a, a part of this year, but for New Zealand, uh, things look like it'll be reasonably gradual. We've got the earthquake reconstruction. And from a rural perspective, I think the key thing is that how well we do over the next couple of years is going to be linked, for better or for worse, with how Asia fares uh, with the other world problems. Because for us, yes, we still have a fair amount of exposure to, to Europe, um, but it's about 7% of our trade now. We've got 60% of our trade going to the Asia Pacific and it's those Asian markets, including uh, particularly for dairy, uh, which is really key. So the strength of demand in Asia uh, is very key. And fingers crossed that the Europeans just muddle their way through things. Um, Asia is still going to be you know, the strong driver of growth for the global economy over the next year. But for all the exporters and for farmers, the high New Zealand dollar continues to be a real problem. Uh, what are you seeing over the next six months? Well, in, in some ways like where the currency's got has been a bit of a surprise because we still don't have the Europeans really solving their problems but markets seem to have become a bit calmer 
nonetheless. So we've been seeing risk premiums easing back. We've seen uh, the New Zealand dollar actually rising you know, a fair amount against the euro and the pound during this period. Look, we do suspect that they will come off their, come off their peaks and come back, but the reality is, is that we, we are facing some challenging exchange rates within those countries, and we will, and I think for New Zealand, looking to the countries that are growing fast and don't have these perennial problems that are going to be influencing Europe and the UK for many years to come is really where we need to, to look and we don't have those same exchange rate pressures that we do in those markets that are growing fast and pretty hungry for our product. Now, interesting that you talk about how we've got to hitch our wagon uh, to China, for example, and we've certainly done that with the Crave for Farm sale. But what I'm wondering is, you know, I listened to the, I listened to James, I listened to uh, John Key say that uh, according to them, less than one percent of uh, of our land is owned by foreigners, uh, less than one percent of farmland. But it's not less than one percent of our dairy farms. I mean, this is a big chunk of land that's now gone to the Chinese. Yeah, it is a big chunk, it's a, but it's the first one. Um, you know, there have been, I guess the other important thing is that there's been no Chinese interest buying farmland in New Zealand over the past two years. There has been a, a lot of farmland, in particular dairy farms, being bought by, by German and Swiss interests, uh, European interests. Um, and that has in some ways uh, held up the land market. So, so farmers have, have potentially benefited out of that in some ways. But um, you do, do, do make a, big, uh, a good point. The OIO application did mention that um, there's a lot of uh, political um, uh, mana, I guess, about this particular deal, and there's going to be a lot of uh, focus on it from Chinese interest because there are other investors out there that are looking to, uh, to invest into New Zealand farmland. Probably dairy, considering that uh, there's a lot of dairy product heading up to China. It's an important product for them. So they're going to be watching this to see how it, how it has unfolded. And I think the rest of the world's going to be watching too. And the question, Nick, does this send the signal that it's now open season on our farmland here in New Zealand to any foreign buyers? Well, we have, the reality is, had a lot of people buying land in New Zealand. And I think from a New Zealand context, what we've got to remember is, is that we've got a 100-year history on relying on foreign capital and foreign savings to fund things in here. We don't have enough to fund all the investment that we, that we do here. Um, even in the case of, of farming, which, um, you know, the structure of it really means that the only way in which it's funded is through farmers' equity or farmers' uh, ability to, to borrow money to pay, to pay for things. And as a nation, um, we do rely on others to provide those savings to help, help fund that. So, look, we, we have, as a nation, we're in that situation. We are, we are a debtor nation. Um, and that is the reality, is, is that we, we have for a long time been reliant on other people's capital. Are young farmers here going to be priced right out of the market now if they have to compete with foreign buyers? Well, I, I think it's uh, with the issue over land prices relating to foreign buyers. I mean, it, do, it really does seem to be at the margin. I think the reality is, is that what we have had in New Zealand is a massive farming boom and, and those high commodity prices, which have been very quickly capitalised into land prices. And it's, you know, reality is, is that most farm purchases are, are New Zealanders. Are we going to see now the beginning of more state-owned assets uh, uh, going up for sale? I'm thinking of Mighty River Power. Uh, uh, the Maori now signalling that they're not happy and they may withdraw their support from the national government. That may just be political manoeuvring at this point in time. Uh, what do you think? Oh, well, they've already signalled that they um, that they certainly want to sell down some of these state-owned assets. So, you know, I think that is that is going to happen, um, assuming that there is the political support there for it. Um, they've gone in one direction and they've asked voters to vote for them if they want um, those asset sales to go ahead. And they've won the election, and it's you know it certainly seems like it's going through. So, I, I do think that 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 will be the case. Um, I guess there'll be a lot of things to unfold through this year, but you know, you made the point about whether we are going to see more of this sort of things happening overseas. Um, one of the key things out of this uh, out of this process is that they, were, they really scrutinise the individuals. The the individual um, has that is has bought the Crafer Farms. They have huge financial resources. They uh, they own farmland and farm processes in overseas countries, particularly South America. They have hired uh, local experts in farm um, in farming here in. New Zealand um, doing a, a joint venture with, with Landcorp, that sort of thing. So they have certainly put in all the, the right procedures looking to develop their own market. I guess the question is that that's going to be required if, the, if any other uh, venture wants to come here at home and, and farm in New Zealand. And is it time for New Zealanders to be a little tougher when they negotiate uh, on the international marketplace? Isn't it time that we said to the Chinese, you're allowed to buy land here, we want to buy some of yours. We're not able to do that yet. 
Well, the reality is different countries do have um, different rules. So China's not the only one. It's probably pretty tough to go and buy property in uh, Rarotonga if you want to. Thailand, even even Switzerland. We, I think we do have to recognise other countries do have slightly um, different legal systems. And it probably wasn't too far ago where uh, no one was allowed to own, own land in, in China. Um, I think the reality for, for New Zealand is look, we have uh, a pretty high quality free trade agreement with China. We have benefited massively from that over the last few years. Our dairy exports to China gone up fivefold. We account for 60% of China's dairy imports. We're doing really well, particularly for that dairy side, with the free trade agreement. But it is also about those free investment flows. For New Zealand, one of the payoffs we're getting is, is that we, Fonterra is being treated um, very favourably in China as it's trying to expand there. So look, let's not forget, we are also benefiting from our ability to expand and set up operations in China. Yes, we might not be able to own the land, but we're able to expand and exert our influence in what's likely to be a pretty key market for us going forward. And for us going forward, of course, we've got to worry now, all of us, about the New Zealand economy. And for me, no surprises, now that John Key is back in power, he admits, oh, uh, maybe I was a little ambitious in saying how quickly we'd be back into surplus. Uh, he's signaling that it's going to be really tough, lean times. Yeah, well, I mean, that's going to be a trend, I think, that we're going to see from a lot of other countries around the world that they have, you know, are going to have to redo some of their forecasts. Things aren't quite as rosy now, 12 months on from the beginning of 2011, that most people were, were probably predicting. But, you know, yes, the, yes uh, the Prime Minister has pulled back his forecast. We, they're still going to be in, in, in surplus by 2014-15, but, um, you know, it's just going to be a little bit, there's going to be so a, a grey area. So um, he says. That, that's right, yeah. And yet the rebuild now in, in Christchurch, of course, has been pushed back again. No surprises there. I heard that there have been 10,000 uh, quakes, 10,000 shocks through... Christchurch area since the big one first hit. I mean, that's incredible. Uh, that's going to hurt the economy as well, is it not, Nick? Well, it does look like it's risking delaying the rebuild. We, the rebuild looked like it was going to be getting underway. And it's going to be a lot more. He's year. boosted up from the, what? Up to 30 billion from 20. Yeah, well, 30, but that 30 billion figure that the Reserve Bank governor was talking about is also including some non building costs, like the simple, all these costs going around with processing claims and the like. But the rebuild is probably likely to be over, over 20 billion. Uh, it means we're going to get that boost to that construction sector, but probably coming in a bit, bit later. It's either later this year or very concertedly early, early next year, finger, fingers crossed. Um, that probably has influenced the government's outlook for um, the economy and when it gets the tax take as well. And of course the global environment is a bit weaker compared to when the government did its um, last forecast just ahead of the last election. So we, we might well get back into surplus 2014-2015. Um, there's also the issue that the government can, if it looks like the revenue side, could get hit. They'll probably start looking harder at making sure that the spending that they are doing, they're getting the best bang for the buck out of it. Um, but we're in an environment here in New Zealand where look, money isn't growing on trees and that is why we are seeing the government look at alternative ways of either raising money, getting more efficiency into, into the private sector because it can't just go out and grab money off the trees and then, and then spend it willy-nilly. Yeah, the, the hard choices it, have to be made. Hard choices and also hard action plans. Uh, John Key has just recently had his State of the Nation. He's come up with 120 points that are going to kickstart us back to economic good times. But I got to be honest, not a lot of uh, detail there. Lots yeah, well, of platitudes, but not a lot of detail. How the heck are we going to get there? Well, I guess a key point, first one I think was uh, being diligent around finances, which is, I mean, that's just a given that it has to be done around the world, otherwise you're going to get hammed by credit rating agencies, right? Yeah. All the, uh, you know, um, funding costs, that sort of thing. Uh, building efficiencies, as Nick's pointed out, Christchurch rebuild. Um, yeah, probably not a lot of detail around that, but um, uh, in times like this, you, you probably do need a little bit of wriggle room too, and he's, uh, he's, <laughs> he's making the most of that. Don't give up your day jobs, <laughs> either of you. I think we're all going to need them. Thanks, guys. Coming up after the break, Future Proof on the highways and byways of the economic world as our experts take us along for the ride and point out what's coming up. But first, a question for you in our Farmers Facts and Figures quiz. According to Federated Farmers, in the last 10 years, what percentage of the farmland has been sold to foreigners? Find out after the break. Come back quick. Welcome back to Money Talks. Just before the break, we asked you, according to Federated Farmers, in the last 10 years, what percentage of our farmland has been sold to foreigners? 
less than 2% of New Zealand farmland has been sold to overseas investors. Uh, now, James, I wanted to talk to you about the new regulations that the government would like to bring in, which will affect how Fonterra does business. Tell me more. Yeah, well, uh, this has had a lot of publicity over the past uh, week or so, and I, I'm just not too sure whether it has been handled uh, correctly. I mean, some of the changes are around, they're going to increase the uh, uh, milk available uh, for other processes, for the independent processes, but they're going to put a limit on the amount of time that they can they can use that, as well as the Commerce Commission, I think, going to um, uh, look at, uh, at uh, holding the milk price manual and um, making sure that um, the milk price is, is highly efficient. But so... I, in my opinion, then there are some there's some wins and some losses in there for Fonterra and for Fonterra, she, Fonterra shareholders. If I was a shareholder, I probably wouldn't be that happy because they are giving away a little bit. Um, but the good news is that you know under the current regulations, then independent processes, those processes that that may have overseas shareholdings, as as some of them do, then you know they have they can have that uh, that supply, uh, the dairy milk supply over a number of years. Whereas under these new regulations, that's going to be uh, minimised to to three years. So, so, you know, that's quite a big change. There is an end in sight after that three years, then, um, you know, they don't have to worry about uh, some of those dairy regulations, which is, which is quite important and positive for farmers, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, do you think this has partly been brought on, Nick, by Fonterra and, and the way it's now perceived by the general public? Perhaps it hasn't uh, done the best job on the PR front. Well, I, th I think for Fonterra, the, the, the issue is is that it has been created as essentially a domestic monopoly so that we will get that much better market power in the, in the global um, dairy market, and that really helps us a lot in terms of our influence we have on that market. Um, the reality is if you are a monopoly, you are going to get a lot of scrutiny. And it's reality for Fonterra is, I mean, that's the payoff for, for having that um, extra market power globally. Uh, and as we learned with telecom, I think the key thing is, is that if you are in that monopoly position, I think it's, you know, that transparency and giving people that assurance that everything's above board is, is quite important. And even just a bit of transparency can, can be a bit helpful in that. What do they say? Perception is reality. So even if you're, you know, one of the biggest, most successful companies in the world, you still have to be careful how you do business. Well, it's that issue of yeah, monopolies. We always have to be a little bit careful um, with them. They tend to get a lot more attention from, from governments, and that, that is the, the reality of that sort of situation. Nick, what are you going to be following over the next seven days? Well, for us, on the economic data front, um, we've got the US payrolls, and they've been showing some almost some signs of life recently, so there'll be a bit more focus coming through on those. Uh, we are forever watching Greece. There is the, the wrangling over the, 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 pr the voluntary private sector um, haircut, which is a lot larger than was initially proposed uh, last year. So waiting for that uh, never-ending saga to end will be another thing markets are keeping an eye on. And of course, uh, Dr Bollard is um, not going to be um, going up for his next uh, Five-year term is his term ends in September, so there'll be that the start of the speculation about who's going to be coming up for that. And, and Genevieve, I'm probably the the absolute dark outside wild. <laughs> yeah, horse you're going to throw your hat in, go James. We're going to vote for him, aren't we? That's right. Hey, <laughs> we'll be we calling John Key. Pick pick our <laughs> buddy Nick. Vote. <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. That'd be great. Listen, how do you think he's done over the what is it six years now? He's been uh, he's been trying to help us all out. <laughs> Well, he's been in there since 2002, and I think he's had one of the most challenging periods as governor in his second term, and I think he's handled things in a very pragmatic and responsive way. So, look, everybody uh, can criticise monetary policy. You're usually always uh, annoying half the population with the decisions you make, but it's been a challenging time, and I think he's done a, done a great job during that. Some say he may have been too dovish, played it too safe, and that because of that, between 2002, 2008, the property, uh, the property market here went just crazy. Uh, he could have been tougher on interest rates. What do you reckon, James? Well, it was pretty tough. He was pretty tough, uh, you know, with uh, with an OCR up to 8.25%, you know, at that peak. Um, it could have gone higher. Um, you know, I'd be interested in Nick's thoughts on that. But, um, you know, I think uh, I think he did probably tried to control it as best, he, as best he could. But, you know, this was a problem that a lot of countries were facing around the world um, in terms of commodity cycles and pricing cycles, uh, housing cycles, that sort of thing. So, um, but he was very quick to re respond when the recession happen and has, that has helped to minimize some of the effects here at home in New Zealand I think. Thank you very much. Thanks gentlemen. Thanks to my guests rural economist James Shortle and ASB chief economist Nick Tuffley. Be sure to check out the website. Meantime you know what they say make friends make business but a warning when entering a new social circle 
be sure you know your place, like Lucy. <laughs> Keep the faith. See you next time.